Hello and welcome back to the GCN Racing News Show. Okay, I promise, Lloydy will be back in the chair next week. Before that though, this is what we've got coming up today. The Criterium de Dauphiné has kicked off with one of the most nail-biting finishes you're going to see all season. We'll look at where Evenepoel, Roglic and Pogaccia are racing next, while one of the biggest sponsors in the sports are set to leave. That and more on this week's Racing News Show. This week in the world of racing, we learnt that Caleb Ewan needs to find some shorter teammates. I'm not sure if this is going to work because that saddle is too high for him to sit on, even uh, just touching the pedals. Yeah, you need a hacksaw and some gaffer tape to make that one fit. Despite three bike changes in the final five kilometres, he still managed to sprint for second place. Very impressive. We also learnt that there are only three certainties in life. Death, taxes, and a Derek G attack. From Bergamo to Brussels, you just can't hold that man down. Bahrain Victorious have a new look for the Tour de France. And finally, we learned that stage one of the Criterium de Dauphiné was a heartbreaker. The race is of course often used as final prep for the key Tour de France protagonists and things began with a tricky stage to chambon sur lac after 88 kilometers, the riders began three laps of a circuit which included an ascent of the Côte de Rocher d'Aigle. That was enough to force the likes of Dylan Grunewagen and Sam Bennett out of contention, while Ethan Hayter was forced to abandon after a crash where he suffered a fractured collarbone, so wishing him all the best with his recovery. Runa Herogotz was the final rider left from a good breakaway group, but he only had a handful of seconds as he crested the final climb and dropped Dorian Godon. However, he flew down the descent with Jumbo Visma controlling things stringently behind, and with one kilometer to go, he still held a lead over the chasing pack. Cruelly though, the road kicked uphill and Herogotz looked over his shoulder with 150 meters left to see the sprinters bearing down on him. Jumbo Visma's Christophe Laporte reeled him in and passed him at the very last moment. Matteo Trentin was second, with Herogotz holding on for third. One of the closest finishes you're going to see all season. Here's what Herogotz had to say at the finish. I gave everything, so yeah. I... I can't be disappointed when you when you give everything to the line. Then uh, then you can only be happy with the performance. And yeah, today it uh, it was just not enough. A cruel finish for him. But Laporte has now won stages at all three French stage races at world tour level since he signed with Jumbo Visma last season. Also worth noting that Emmerich Mass, Michael Lanza, Louis Meinkiers, and Emmanuel Buchmann all lost at least 15 seconds in the GC. Anyway. How indicative of success at the Tour de France is the Criterium de Dauphiné? The last rider to win both races in the same year was Geraint Thomas, who won both the Dauphiné and the Tour in 2018. And this was often the case for Team Sky riders in the 2010s. The team won both races in the same season five times across the decade, with Chris Froome achieving the feat three times, while Bradley Wiggins did it in 2012. So. Obviously, the Dauphiné is often a key indicator as to who could be about to perform well and maybe even win the Tour in July. So here are five riders to watch at this year's race. And where else to start? We all know about Egan Bernal's catastrophic crash in January 2022, which derailed his entire season and almost even cost him his life. His 2023 season has been disjointed with multiple crashes, notably recently going down at the Tour of Hungary in May but I think Bernal could be about to find some of his best legs again. He was eighth place on the tie in 2000 at the Tour de Romandie in April. Of course, not the best result in his career, but a result which showed Bernal's form is trending in the right direction. It does look like Bernal could be heading back to the Tour de France this year, although it's not been officially announced by the team. And a good result at the Dauphiné this week would do his confidence the world of good. Another rider I'm excited to watch at the Dauphiné is Max Poole. The Brit is just 20 years old and this is only his second World Tour stage race in his entire career. The first was the Tour de Romandie in April where he was a mighty fourth place overall, only beaten by Adam Yates, Matteo Jorgensen and Damiano Caruso there. Poole is part of a very young Team DSM lineup. Five of their seven riders are 23 or under but I don't think that will stop Paul from mixing it with the big names. So make sure we keep an eye out for him this week. 
Victor Campanats has returned to racing at the Dauphiné for the first time since March. He crashed out of the Bradener Coxsider Classic and suffered a fractured vertebrae, meaning he missed the Classics campaign almost in its entirety. So not expecting too much in terms of results from Campanats this week in France, but it will be great to see him back on his bike in competitive action. Groupama FDJ finished fourth at the Tour de France last year with David Godou, of course, and it would be no surprise to see him match that or step onto the podium at the Dauphiné this week. I'm particularly keen to see how he performs on stage four. The 31 km time trial course does feature some climbing, which will work in his favor, but the discipline used to be a real nemesis for Godou. He has made steady improvements though. He was 23rd in a time trial of similar length at last year's Dauphiné. Although there are only 22 kilometers of time trialing at the Tour this year, it will be interesting to see how Godou and the rest of the GC favorites are going. And finally, Richard Carapaz. He's not really known for his form in one week racing. He's a real three week specialist who comes into his own the longer a Grand Tour goes on. The data backs that up too. He's finished on the final podium in four of the previous six Grand Tours that he's finished, but has only been on the podium in two of the eight previous one weekers he's completed. That's only considering races at World Tour level. However, he won the Mercantile Classic last Monday, which showed that his high altitude training in the Pyrenees is already paying dividends. He delivered a ferocious attack with seven kilometers to go on the Valberg to distance the field. Felix Gau chased him down though, and Carapaz had to work very hard to keep the plucky Austrian at bay. At one point, the gap between the two was down to around four or five seconds, with Lennart van Etveld, Lenny Martinez, and Christian Rodriguez further back, but Carapaz did enough to win his first race on European soil this season. So, despite Carapaz's relative lack of success in one weekers compared to Grand Tours, I think we could see him at the top of his game this week at the Dauphiné. Saying that though, the favorite to win the Dauphiné is of course, Jonas Vinegard. Jumbo Visma DS, Marijn Zeeman has announced the team's Tour de France lineup to Dutch newspaper, Algemeen Dagblad. Primoz Roglic will not be at the Tour after triumphing at the Giro last month. And with Dylan van Baarle inserted into the squad, that's the only change from their all-conquering 2022 team, with Vingegaard, Van Aert, Laporte, Kuss, Kreuzweig, Benut, and Van Hooydonk also on the provisional list, while Wilco Kelderman is the first backup. Whereas for Roglic, Zeman says he'll confirm plans with the Giro champ at a later date, but suggested that a return to the Vuelta a España could be on the cards before he focuses on Il Lombardia. Moving on, we did consider whether Remco Evenepoel would head to the Tour de France after he was forced to abandon the Giro last month. He'll return to action next week at the Tour de Suisse and follow that with the national championships. He will not be at the Tour de France in July though. Instead, he'll head to the team's training camp in Val de Fassa before focusing on the World Championships in Great Britain in early August, where he'll of course be defending the rainbow bands in the road race. Tadej Pogaccia will not return to the Tour of Slovenia this year. He's made a habit of racing his home tour in preparation for the Tour de France and won the race in 21 and 22 even deciding one stage with a game of rock, paper, scissors. After numerous weeks off the bike following his broken wrist at liege baston liege Pogaccio will only race the national championships road race and time trial before heading to the Basque Country for the Grand Departs at the Tour de France. Speaking to the press in the last few days, Pogaccio said, hopefully I'll be at 100%, maybe the wrist will not be at 100%, but I think the legs can be. Okay, let's wrap up the Tour of Norway then, and we only had one stage left in last week's show. That was a mass sprint in Stavanger, and Alex Kristoff won on home soil for both rider and team. He defeated Tobias Lund Andreasen and a fast finishing Jordi Meus. That result also meant that Ben Tulit secured overall victory ahead of his Ineos teammate, Magna Sheffield. That's the first stage race victory of Tulit's career, He's just 21 years old and already has a Grand Tour in his legs via the Giro d'Italia last season as well. So the future is certainly looking bright for him. The Brussels Cycling Classic took place on Sunday and with a sense of some iconic climbs and cobblestones scattered throughout the course, it was no doubt going to be a tough day out. No rest for Derek G either. He was at the front with two kilometers left and couldn't resist an attack, obviously. 
That came to nothing though, and Kell O'Brien's counter-attack had more of a chance. That was reeled in too though, and the sprinters would have their fun. Arnold de Mar just outlasted Lund Andreasen and Mayos again, who were denied in an eerily similar fashion to the final stage in Norway earlier in the week. Some stage racing down in Spain now with the women's Vuelta Andalusia, and we were treated to a thrilling GC battle that came all the way down to the final day. Tamara Dronova of Israel Premier Tech Roland held the yellow jersey for the first four days courtesy of some dominant wins in the punchy uphill finishes on stages one and two. The race absolutely blew to pieces on stage five, however, and the Norwegian duo of Katrine Alarud and Mia Bjornadal Otterstad were able to capitalize. They successfully overturned Dronova's 47 second lead on GC at the start of the day, with Otterstad going on to take the stage win and Alarud the overall by a margin of five seconds, with Dronova third at 29 seconds. Special mentions to Sara Martin, the winner of stage four, who continues to improve after some bad luck with injury the last couple of seasons, and Marta Romeo of the Continental Fundacion Uscardi team, who took a classy solo win on stage three. And what a result for Team DSM at Dwar's Door de Westhook, with Pfeiffer Georgie, Lea Carinier, and Charlotte Kuhl finishing in a 1-2-3 over a minute clear of everyone else. Over now to what is widely regarded as the premier gravel event on the calendar, Unbound, and some downright horrendous downpours made the course a challenge to say the least. Our very own Connor Dunn was racing the Elite Men's 200 and can certainly attest to the conditions. No one told me I'd be running. <laughs> 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 More of that in a GCM video coming soon. Anyway, Keegan Swenson and Carolyn Sheff won the men's and women's 200 mile races respectively. Swenson was second last year and arrived at the finish in a group of seven this time, remarkable after over 10 hours of racing. He was the quickest though, finishing ahead of Petr Vakoc and Lachlan Morton. Chef's victory was more comfortable. She won by a margin of 15 minutes over Sofia Gomez Villafane with Sarah Sturm in third. Okay, let's have a look at what's coming up this week on GCN Plus. Of course, the Criterium de Dauphiné continues daily. The stages to look out for there are the long time trial on Wednesday before the big mountains at the weekend. Saturday's stage seven features both the Col de la Madeleine and the Col de la Croix de Fer, two mythical alpine climbs. Territory restrictions do apply there. The ZLM Tour also gets underway on Wednesday. That's a five-day stage race, and the man to watch is Olav Koy. He won three of the five stages last year and finished second in the other two. Not bad at all. That's available worldwide apart from in the US and Canada. The CIC Women's International Tour of the Pyrenees begins on Friday and concludes on Sunday. Doors Door Hagland is taking place on Saturday and Matthew van der Poel returns to action there with Elfstede and Ronde Bruges on Sunday. Both of those are available worldwide. And the Tour de Suisse gets underway on Sunday too, where Wout van Aert and Tom Pidcock are set to return to action alongside Remco Avenepoel. Eight stages in Switzerland, territory restrictions do apply on that one. The UCI Mountain Bike World Cup continues from Friday 9th of June through the weekend. XC and Downhill, that's available worldwide. And remember, you can get all the mountain bike gossip on the GMBN Racing News Show too. This week's World of Cycling is about Chris Froome and the legacy he'll leave on the sports. We'll look at some of his best days on the bike, as well as talking to the man himself at the Tour of Rwanda earlier this year. That'll be released on Wednesday this week. I'm looking forward to this week's documentary too. It's the latest in our Super Team series and it's all about Team Sky. Former rider Nico Roche and cycling journalist Andy McGrath join Lloydie to discuss how Sky managed to sweep aside the competition in the 2010s and how their influence changed the way pro teams operate today. Take a look. Team Sky, a British outfit that for the best part of a decade made the Tour de France yellow jersey their own. One man's mission that sparked a sporting revolution. I think he saw that it was now or never in terms of creating a British team. They were ambitious. We were relentless in our quest to win Grand Tours. Wealthy. But they couldn't compare with Team Sky's budget. And built a squad filled with the sport's biggest stars. Bye. 
Mark Cavendish gets four wins in the last four years in Paris. It was like the dream team being created and I was just dying to go there. They were rewarded with huge success. This is what Team Sky do the best. But controversy was never far away. We were going to stop at nothing to get him. Cycling's cutthroat. If you want to be the best, it's not about making friends. I can't wait to watch that one myself. That'll be released on Tuesday, so tomorrow if you're watching this the day it's uploaded. Sponsorship news now, and Yumbo Visma will lose their title sponsor Yumbo by the end of the 2024 season. The Dutch supermarket chain will honour the current agreement until the end of next season, but are open to the team finding a new title sponsor before that. That's not the only change in cycling sponsorship this week, because by the time the Tour de France and Giro d'Italia Donne roll around, Trek Segafredo will not be called Trek Segafredo. Lidl will take over as the team's title sponsor, so the team will soon be known as Lidl Trek. Also, B&B Hotels have found a way back into the pro peloton. They'll replace Samsic as co-sponsors of the current Arkea Samsic team from the beginning of the 2024 campaign. So a little bit of a sponsorship reshuffle across the board. In other news, Pup Pizza has signed a new deal with Phoenix de Koenig until 2027, which is the longest current deal in the Women's World Tour. The 21-year-old is focusing on a mountain bike calendar this summer but has already demonstrated her credentials in road races with sixth at Strada Bianche Donne, which became fifth after Kristen Faulkner was disqualified. Antonio Tiberi has joined Bahrain Victorious after he was axed by Trek Segafredo following news that he'd shot and killed a cat. In the team press release, Tiberi said, with the help of this team, I will demonstrate that I learned from the mistake I made in the past. The Italian finished in the top 10 at both the Tour Down Under and the UAE Tour earlier this year. The Tour of Scandinavia has been reduced to five stages from the originally planned six. Managing Director Roy Moberg has highlighted the rising cost of goods and services and the lack of sponsors in Sweden as the primary reasons for having to eliminate stage two from the calendar, which was set to be the only stage in Sweden. The race's other stages, which span across Denmark and Norway, will still go ahead as planned, with the race starting a day later on Wednesday 23rd of August. Shari Basait has been suspended by Canyon SRAM after she tested positive for Letrozole following stage 3 of the Tour of Normandy in March, a stage which she won. She protested her innocence in a recent press conference and plans to appeal with a view to returning to competition. OK, that's all we have time for this week. Enjoy your racing and Lloydie will see you next time. Goodbye for now.